Welcome, welcome everybody. It's my uh, great pleasure as moderator of this panel uh, to bring to you uh, our general counsels of uh, the two major leagues, uh, that being Dan, Dan Halem, MLB, Jeff Pash, good friend, NFL, and not Rick Buchanan, who was taken ill, but Mike Zarin's doing double duty. He was on our panel this morning. He's here to speak uh, on behalf of the NBA and NBA-related issues. So uh, we ri wish Rick well. And Mike, thank you so much for pinch hitting. Thanks to each of you guys so much for being here. Let's just start with how you got, where you got, and those who want to end up being GCs for one of the major leagues. Dan, how do they go about doing it? Please, and welcome. <laughs> Coming to Harvard Law School is not a bad start. Um, actually, my roommate um, at Harvard was a guy named Dave Denenberg, who works oh, sure. for the NBA now. Yeah, exactly. And, and Dan Rube, um, classmate, also works for the NBA. So a lot of people, a lot of lawyers, obviously, go into sports. And um, a lot of lawyers from Harvard Law School go into sports. Um, I did it the traditional way, um, if there is a traditional way. I um, went undergraduate to um, Cornell School of Industrial and Labor Relations, same as our commissioner. So. I was a labor guy. I came here, um, took a lot of labor law classes, and went to Proskauer after um, law school and did labor law and um, intersected with Jeff to my right after he went to the um, NHL when I was a young associate. I um, you know, worked on um, NHL matters. I had a little labor strife back then at uh, Jeff's kind of Fomented. Early, yeah, <laughs> fomented labor um, uh, descent. But, um, and then um, you did a lot of MBA work for Rick Buchanan, who's not here. Um, just a little word about, um, you know, Jeff, um, who I see every now and again. Um, Jeff looked like 15 years old when he was general counsel of the NHL, and now he looks like 35. And, and, if, and, if, and, if, and, if, and if Rick was here, Rick hasn't aged at all. So um, it, it is it, zero. So I mean, it is stressful work, but um, Jeff and Rick seem to have the secret formula. So I did labor law at Proskauer, which um, obviously sports leagues um, during the period from the early 90s, you know, through actually today, have had a lot of labor strife. So got a lot of experience in that area. Um, started doing salary arbitration for uh, Major League Baseball, um, the late 90s, early 2000s. Um, then there was um, an incident where, I don't know if you remember it, a um, bunch of Major League umpires, about 20 of them resigned, um, led by a guy named Richie Phillips. And baseball hired Proskauer to handle that. So. Um, through that representation, I got to know um, our current commissioner, Rob Manford, did baseball work um, um, you know, for about eight or nine years and then went in-house in 2007 um, doing labor relations and um, for our, our commissioner um, who um, previously had my job and kind of rode his coattails to where I am now. So that's the way you do it. Find, 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 <laughs> find good people to latch on to. So, um, but you know, we'll, 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 look, you have to, um, you know, have an expertise um, in whatever you do. Um, I was a labor lawyer and thought I would be a labor lawyer, you know, um, for the rest of my life. Um, and, you know, just kind of gravitated into the sports industry. Just not really uh, planned. It just kind of happened that way. But uh, I still consider myself a labor lawyer. Um, you know, I do a lot of different things for baseball now. But at the end of the day, I mean, I'm getting paid to negotiate our collective bargaining agreement. I mean, that's kind of what I do. And, um, you know, and I think what I'm most skilled at. Um, so just whatever you decide to do, be very good at it, and the rest will follow. Yeah, thanks, Ed. Let me just uh, you know, ask Jeff the same thing. How big is your department? How, are you, how do you break it up? And, and so on. So now, OK, so I have, um, we have a lot of lawyers um, that report up to one, a classmate of mine, actually, uh, Mike Mellis, who's our general counsel, who reports up to me. Um, we have a separate group of lawyers and business school types who are in our labor relations department that do a mix of um, sort of analytical work, legal work, um, and dealing with um, both of our unions. Um, I also have department investigations, which is kind of a high volume uh, uh, department these days, which does all our investigations. Um, ranging from domestic violence, um, issues um, between teams, um, anything that needs to be investigated um, involving a breach of, potential breach of our rules, um, they do. I have diversity, I have HR, um, and government relations. So that's kind wow. of the, the current lineup. 
Wow, Jeff, please. Uh, I guess uh, I guess my own uh, experience uh, is uh, not too dissimilar from from Dan's. I, uh, although I've said many times that I got where I am today by really uh, pure dumb luck. I didn't really have <laughs> didn't really have that much to do with it. I I went to uh, work at a. Uh, after being the last person admitted to my class at Harvard Law School, <laughs> which was a little bit of concern, but as I said to my dad, I really can only go in one direction, so <laughs> that calmed him down a little bit. I was then the last person accepted to the associate class at Covington and Burling after I graduated, and, uh, and I showed up, and I was assigned to work for a guy named Paul Tagliabue. Uh, as uh, as it happened, and uh, he uh, he at the time was the partner who managed the NFL account, and to show how seriously big law firms take, you know what incoming associates say. I was asked what would I like to do. I didn't even know that Covington and Burling represented the NFL. I certainly didn't ask to work on NFL matters, but he needed an associate, and because uh, we were, the NFL was in the midst of. Uh, big piece of litigation with a fellow out in California by the name of Al Davis. And uh, he needed an associate to hang out in the library and research all kinds of different things. So I started working for, for Paul. And I worked on uh, all the Raider litigation, which took up several years. Then uh, that finished. And in the, in the midst of it, we had a player strike. Then we had litigation in the mid-'80s with an outfit called the United States Football League. And they, uh, they had an owner uh, of a team in the New York area who has, <laughs> has, has, since, has since gone on to, I guess, the bigger and better things. But uh, having uh, dealt with him back uh, in the mid-1980s, I can't say that too much of what I see today surprises me. <laughs> uh, just leave it at that. Um, the, uh, uh, and then uh, we had labor issues. Uh, and and another uh, another strike followed by a lot of labor litigation and antitrust litigation in Minnesota in the late 1980s, early 1990s. By then, uh, Paul had left the uh, firm and had become the commissioner of the NFL, succeeding uh, Pete Rozelle. Uh, and, uh, and so I was uh, more involved in the NFL work, uh, and I was called in late uh, 1992 by Gary Bettman, who had been the chief legal officer at the NBA and had just been named but had not yet assumed office as the new NHL commissioner. And he called and said, uh, how would you like to come to the NHL and be the general counsel? So I mentioned that to my wife, and uh, she said, well, where's the NHL? I said, it's in New York. She said, forget it. <laughs> So Gary, who's a much, much better salesman than me, that's why he's a commissioner and I'm just a lawyer, <laughs> he uh, got on the phone with her and persuaded her that it would be a great opportunity. Come to New York. You'll love it. Uh, he was right about the first two. He was not really right about the third. <laughs> but, um, but it's uh, worked out, and I was there for four years, and then my predecessor at the NFL retired uh, after 25 years as the general counsel there, and uh, Commissioner Tagliabue asked me if I would like to come to the NFL uh, as this gentleman's successor. So that, uh, that's where I've been ever since. And, and how big is your department? How, how many people report? Uh, our, department, uh, our department is uh, probably in the low 20s as far as lawyers go. We're divided. We have a few people who focus on litigation issues. We have a significant number of people who focus on commercial issues, whether it's stadium financing, uh, league financial issues, or uh, more commonly commercial issues with our broadcasters, our sponsors, consumer products uh, partners. And then we have a group that focuses on labor issues, primarily, if we're not in the midst of collective bargaining, primarily uh, player contracts, advice on that, grievances that come out of player contracts, and the like. I did have to say, uh, Professor, that uh, when I saw your title here, A View from the Top, I thought it was kind of interesting because uh, a lot of times 
Now, you don't know about my colleagues I'm here. Not at the top. But a lot of a lot of a lot of times, I, I I'm reminded. A lot of days, I'm reminded of the story that Professor Tribe told in the last day of Con Law. And I, Larry's not here, but yes, I do remember something of Con Law, in particular this story, which ended. I won't tell the whole story, but it ended with him saying, "I know there's a pony in here somewhere." Yeah. And a lot of times I feel like we're looking for the pony, yeah. uh, as opposed to us uh, sitting on the top of the mountain. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well, thanks, <clears throat> thanks, Jeff, and Mike. Thanks for sitting in for for uh, Rick. Um, so we'll skip over you. <laughs> I, I mean, so, I have to apologize. Uh, I I don't have either the wit or the hair of Rick Buchanan. Right. So those of you who know Rick uh, will miss both of those things, but. Um, <laughs> how is, how is the know, NBA League of there, 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 yeah. There's often a joke among the teams that NBA stands for nothing but attorneys. Yeah. <laughs> and, yeah. and, uh, it's been a so there's, there's, there's between 30 and 40 lawyers at the NBA, and it's not organized so dissimilarly um, to the, the way you know, the colleagues up here have described um, their departments. Um, and I think you know, the, the biggest difference maybe between us and some other leagues is a lot of the marketing stuff is very centralized at the NBA. So the teams at the NBA only have the right to market, to license their logos uh, within 75, oh, it's 150 miles now. And we don't produce any um, apparel at all. That's all done centrally. There's nothing that happens um, from team to team. So if you buy a Lakers jersey, we get 130th. And if you buy a Celtics jersey, the Lakers unfortunately get 130th. So, um, that stuff's handled more centrally at our league, I think, than um, most of the other pro sports leagues around, and that may lead to a few more legal staff there. Um, but I, th I think, you know, I, I can't speak to Rick's whole bio, because uh, I'm not him. <laughs> but I think it's not actually so dissimilar from Dan's. Um, and and, and uh, most of the higher-up lawyers at the league, you know, worked outside beforehand at some firm um, that the league used, and then they got brought in. So that's a sort of good path to that. My path is very different. I, um, I got hired as an intern doing statistical analysis while I was in school here. And uh, all of the team's legal work was being done outside at the time. And they sort of said when they hired me to do some statistical and salary cap stuff, hey, could you also look at some sponsorship contracts? Because you'll be cheaper than the $1,000 an hour Wilmer Hale's charging us to look at this official tire contract that's only worth a few thousand dollars at the time. So. Um, it sort of grew from there, and now we have a full-time business lawyer who's taken over from that stuff from me three or four years ago, um, so I can concentrate on basketball more. But uh, never, ever a dull moment, I'm sure, for any of us. Mm -hmm. Let's go back. Uh, all right, thank you, Mike. Sure. And uh, his bio, he was on our 9 o'clock panel, so <laughs> Mike's bio is, is there. Thanks for doing double duty. So, so Dan, in our prep session, and, and Jeff, we talked about we met the enemy and it's us, right? And, and, and so you have clients and yet sometimes adversarial relationships with those clients. And then you got the players associations. Uh, take, take us through how that works in, in MLB, your, your, your clients being, you know, each of the teams. Sure. Um, ultimately, um, the commissioner who we work for um, works for the owners. They um, elect the commissioner, and um, you know he kind of serves at their pleasure. Um, but you know, by the same token, um, um, the league um, is in some ways, you know, like government. Um, it's a regulatory uh, body. We have to um, enforce rules. We have to make sure um, each team believes um, it's being treated fairly. Um, it also, the league has to resolve um, disputes between clubs, so it's kind of a really tricky, um, you know, set of relationships um, to navigate. Um, you know, most of the time you're kind of advising the club, whether it be the owner, the general manager, um, the general counsel, and you're on the same side as them and trying to solve their problems, but um, other times you're telling them they can't do something they want to do when they get very angry, in some cases, um, you know, may press the issue um, in other times, and we have some of it going on now. You have to investigate teams who are um, accused by other teams or um, find out otherwise may um, be engaging in um, inappropriate <laughs> conduct, um, and that creates an adversarial <laughs> relationship. Um, and then the worst, the ultimate worst, is trying to resolve, you know, team-team disputes where 
there's basically kind of no winning. Um, and, um, you know, I would say that's my least favorite part, probably all commissioners' least favorite parts when you have two kind of owners um, in a dispute, both thinking they're um, absolutely right. And you, when you're, if you're lucky enough and successful enough to own a sports team, um, you know, usually you think you're right most of the time. And um, it's just kind of <laughs> kind of a personality characteristic. Um, so, um, you know, so, so those, those are very difficult. Um, look, I, I, interestingly, the relationship with our players, um, you know, I view that, frankly, as easier. I mean, I understand the relationship. You know, we're not best friends. Um, you know, it's... Uh, in, in a sense, a business relationship. We engage in bargaining um, over a collective bargaining agreement, and frankly, we engage in bargaining or dispute resolution um, every single day. Um, they represent the players, you know, I represent the owners, and we try to work it out. Um, you know, it's just very straightforward. Um, you know, unlike the, um, you know, navigating our internal relationships, not as straightforward because obviously the people um, that you're ultimately beholden to and, and have to advise, you know, oftentimes, you know, you have to take positions they do not appreciate. So, yeah. Well, I, and, and Jeff, your, your relationship with Demari Smith is very pacific and peaceful. <laughs> it's act, homeostatic. It's, 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 actually, it's actually much better than people think. Um, there, is, uh, there is a tremendous uh, common interest between teams and players. I think, I think, you know, Ed Garvey, who was the head of the union for many years and, and could, be a, could be a rather adversarial fellow, um, he, uh, he said, uh, we are the game, meaning the players. And there's a tremendous amount of merit to that. Uh, one of the first things you come to realize is that uh, no fan uh, and no television network and no sponsor is very interested in watching owners or team executives or league attorneys scrimmage against one another. It's the players. That's what, that's, that's, that's. They televise some of our internal meetings, you know. Those, those, might, those might get some good ratings. I agree. I agree. Get Coach Jones up there as he says arm waving, and that, those could be pretty good. But, uh, but it, the game is about the players. The game is about what takes place on the field, on the ice, on the basketball court. That's what attracts people and gives it all of its value. And I, I think over time, and I give a tremendous amount of credit to Gene Upshaw, the late Gene Upshaw, who was a great, great player, a Hall of Fame player, but more than that, he was a Hall of Fame executive, a Hall of Fame leader. And he understood that owners and players ultimately had to come together and had to forge something bigger than just their own narrow interests. And the partnership that he and Paul Tagliabu created, has sustained the NFL for more than 25 years. It's been extremely productive. And while there is occasional sharp rhetoric, there is not yet a divergence in those fundamental interests and that unity between owners and players. And I think you're seeing it. Mm -hmm. I know this may not be exactly what you were looking for, but I'll say this. I think you're seeing that expressed in the context of the current controversy over the national anthem, mm -hmm. which is undoubtedly affecting our game. There's not the slightest question about it. But it has brought our owners and players closer together because I think players are stunned by the level of support they're getting from owners. And owners, in turn, are recognizing that their players are saying something very important, very meaningful, and that the right thing to do is stand behind them. You don't, I mean, you don't hear about it when things are going well between the players and the teams. It's just not, that isn't in the news ever. You only hear about it when something goes wrong. So you have, people have this thought that there's just these constant disputes. And when you're not in bargaining and there isn't some one person controversy, the rest of the time, everyone's goal is to grow the pie, right? And we're just completely business partners. So, um, well, well that's, you know, Jeff is kind enough, and many of uh, my students are here to come to the class. The personal conduct policy, where the commissioner has ultimate authority on appeal, uh, it, it, you describe it better than anybody else. It's very, very, very limited authority. Everything else goes to independent arbitration. Uh, go ahead, take it from there, please. <laughs> Well, uh, 
a major part of any commissioner's uh, role, going all the way back to, I didn't know him personally, but going all the way back to Kennesaw Mountain Landis, is um, the authority to establish rules, a, a code of conduct, and then police and enforce those rules. And over the years, in the context of collective bargaining, different leagues at different times have set up procedures for resolving those issues. So in the NFL, if you have an on-field issue, I don't know if anyone watched the game last night, I hope everyone did, but just in case you didn't, there was a, a play where the Baltimore quarterback was knocked out of the game, almost certainly by an illegal hit, uh, almost certainly a play that will result in some discipline uh, involving that the player from Miami who delivered the blow. And if he chooses to appeal that, it will go to a jointly appointed appeal officer, a former player, who will hear his appeal and decide whether he should be fined, suspended, etc. If you have a violation of our drug or steroid policies, those get heard by arbitrators who have been selected based on their knowledge and expertise in that area. If you have a dispute, if you have a dispute with your team over your contract, was I released in accordance with the contract? Did I earn a bonus and not get paid, et cetera? That goes to a jointly appointed grievance arbitrator. The one area where the commissioner retains his authority, and the only reason that he retains that authority is because the union agreed to it in collective bargaining. It's a very important point that is frequently overlooked. Is in the context is in the context of what's called conduct detrimental or integrity of the game. In baseball, they would call it best interest of baseball. There's a parallel concept in basketball and hockey. The wording is different, but it's the same thing. It's the integrity of the game. And in those areas, the commissioner retains his disciplinary authority not only to impose the sanction, but then to determine any appeal from those initial sanctions. That's all laid out in the clearest possible language in the collective bargaining agreement. It's a very, very narrow slice of what the commissioner does in terms of disciplining players, coaches, or others. And it involves a bare handful of players. Of 2,000 NFL players, if you have 15 cases like that a year, it would be a lot. Uh, because despite the attention that these issues get, the vast majority of players in the NFL and in the National Hockey League, the two leagues that I worked for, and I'm quite certain this is true in the other two <coughs> leagues, are very, very high quality people. They couldn't have accomplished what they've accomplished as professional athletes if they didn't have tremendous dedication, tremendous mental acuity. If you've ever seen a playbook in the NFL, you know how complicated it is. The tremendous fortitude and stamina, a great work ethic. These are high quality men. They are good community men. J.J. Watt raised more money for Houston for hurricane relief than probably dozens of other charities put together. They're really quite exceptional. And the number of people who run afoul of personal conduct policy is a very, very small number and should not be viewed as characterizing athletes as a whole in the NFL or any other sport. Thanks. That, that personal conduct policy point. Go ahead. Say it again. It was collectively <laughs> bargained. Right? I mean, uh, it's not only was collectively bargained, it has been collectively bargained in identical words for more than 40 years. Right. If you go back to the 1977 collective bargaining agreement, the language is the same. It's not like something was slipped in, in the under, you know, cover of darkness. It's been there for 40 years and dozens of, and it's been there for, through three commissioners, three separate leaders of the union. It's, it's, not, it's not a new concept. Let's go to the other two leagues. So, Dan, so, so with the independent arbitrator, you rarely see, you almost never see it leaking out into the court system in either of the other two leagues. And then we'll come back to, to Jeff to comment on how and why it does seem to more yeah. often in the NFL. Yeah, a, a lot of it has to do um, 
just kind of with history, uh, labor relations history. Our unions um, has always been just a very traditional union. Uh, in, in terms of our system, uh, just like the NFL um, and the NBA, I think the NHL too, um, on-field uh, misconduct, um, the penalty is determined by the commissioner and ultimately somebody appointed by the commissioner hears the appeal. So we don't go to neutral arbitration um, you know, for pitchers that throw at players' heads or um, brawls on the field. Everything else, um, the commissioner ultimately um, issues a discipline, or in some cases the club issues the discipline, and the player has a right to file a grievance um, and have that grievance heard by um, independent um, arbitration. Because we have had a system of independent arbitration kind of for so long, our, our union um, has not been inclined um, to challenge um, the decisions of arbitrators in court. Um, I don't think it has ever happened, actually, as, as far as I know. Um, and that, I think, has a lot to do with, um, you know, the union was founded by a man named Marvin Miller, um, and then Donald Fear succeeded him, um, and then a, an alumnus of Harvard Law School, uh, Michael Weiner, um, and you know their view was go to arbitration, have a, have a neutral determine it, and then you're done. Um, you know don't don't challenge it in court, and and that's kind of embedded in our union. I mean the only um, um, time I think um, a a challenge was actually it, it happened, but it was withdrawn. Was Alex Rodriguez his 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 arbitration? You know, his, his own lawyers actually filed a, a motion to vacate it, and the union did not support him on that. Um, so it's a lot has to do with kind of the mindset um, of the union. And conversely, we, the league, because we don't run the court either. I mean, we're, we, you know, we live with the decision. Both sides tend to fire the arbitrator if, uh, <laughs> you know, if they get a real bad decision, but y y y y we live with it. And then, Mike, we were talking yeah. in class the other day, <laughs> NBA, and, yeah. you know, these fines for... But Kyrie and, and, and Steph, uh, you know, they just, they don't greet them. It's an, it's an expensive uh, mouth guard throw. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. I, you wow. know, there are some grievances that get heard sure. post-season that you never hear about publicly on some of these things that happen during the season. But I'll just completely echo everything Dan just said. Um, we just don't end up in court, uh, you know, for a bunch of mostly historical reasons, I think. Um, you know, and there's an independent arbitrator, and, and, and they hear a bunch of cases together at the end of the year um, regarding fines or suspensions. But for the most part, you know, we like to think that the, the discipline being issued by the league uh, is similar to that that's been issued in the past, and the parties sort of have a pattern of practice of dealing. And, um, you know, all of this stuff in, in any of these leagues happens in the shadow of the Federal Arbitration Act, which says it's really, really hard to overturn these arbitrations. So um, there's a strong incentive not to go to court anyway because, you know, stuff probably won't get overturned um, most of the time. I know the NFL's had, you know, some different experiences than our league, but um, for the most part, you don't hear about the grievances that happen in the NBA, and they mostly involve, you know, a few smaller fines every year that someone thinks was uh, imposed unjustly. Back to you, Jeff. Well, uh we obviously have had some litigation surrounding some of the disciplinary decisions, but uh, every case, and, and there have been occasions where district judges have uh, <laughs> suggested that they had a different, different view. Uh, but every case that's gone to a federal court of appeals, Paul Tagliabu said years ago uh, when I was a young associate, he, there, we got some decision uh, which didn't go the right way, and he said, well, this is why God invented courts of appeal. <laughs> and, and in fact, every time that a case has gone up to a federal appeals court, it, the district judge uh, has been reversed. The commissioner's authority has been upheld, whether it was the Star Caps case in the Eighth Circuit, the, another case in the Tenth Circuit, a ca uh, case uh, in the Second Circuit, which got a little attention up here, I know, <laughs> and, uh, and a case <laughs> A case in the Eighth Circuit involving a former Minnesota Viking named Adrian, Adrian Peterson. He now plays for the Arizona Cardinals. Uh, but in each case, each instance, those uh, those uh, appeals courts are ruled uh, in a way that upheld the commissioner's authority. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> do you want to comment a little bit further on, on the disconnect right now between the Fifth Circuit and, and the Southern District? 
such as Oh, uh, yes. Uh, well, there's a player for the Dallas Cowboys named Ezekiel Elliott. Uh, after a lengthy investigation, it was determined that he had engaged in uh, physical misconduct with uh, a woman he was involved with in Ohio. Uh, the commissioner imposed a suspension on Mr. Elliott. He uh, appealed it under the personal conduct policy. And before the appeal officer even issued an opinion, the uh, Players Association went into court in a town called Sherman, Texas. Uh, I don't, uh, it's, I guess it's near Dallas, but it's, it's not, it, it's, it's a, a one, one room courthouse in a little town out in the, in the uh, rural part of the county. And they went in there and uh, they <coughs> persuaded a district judge to grant them an injunction um, prohibiting the suspension from taking place. Uh, we asked the Fifth Circuit to take a look at that on a lot of different grounds, including jurisdiction and ripeness and a lot of basic things that you hear about in civil procedure. And the, the Fifth Circuit uh, actually went further than we asked. We had asked simply that there be a stay granted uh, to hold the injunction in abeyance uh, while the matter was litigated. The Fifth Circuit went one step further and said, we're not going to issue a stay. We're going to vacate the injunction because it's perfectly clear that the district judge had no jurisdiction, had no authority to enter this order. We're going to vacate the injunction, and we're going to direct the district judge to dismiss the, the action. So uh, all that took five or six weeks, uh, but that litigation down in Texas now seems to have run its course. So we're now in the Southern District of New York, and uh, we have a hearing on Monday before a judge in the Southern District of New York on a request for a preliminary injunction uh, that would again <laughs> hold Mr. Elliott's suspension in abeyance. Interestingly, we have a second case in the Southern District of New York, which has gotten almost no attention, but it involves a player who was suspended for a violation of the steroid policy, whose appeal was rejected by an independent arbitrator, but who has nonetheless brought suit against us and the players' union, right. saying that the independent arbitration system is corrupt and unreliable and that a district judge should get involved. So. We're sort of in this position where you can't win for losing, I guess. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, and we, have, uh, we have commissioner discipline being challenged. We have independent arbitration being challenged. So we'll, we'll keep our outside counsel busy and sort it all out. <laughs> Let's switch gears. If that's the idiosyncratic nature of the commissioner's authority, we were uh, talking, Dan, about the, the business of baseball exemption, the antitrust exemption, and how broadly it's been uh, you know, extended since Flood v. Kuhn. Yeah, so I'll give you my little uh, baseball exemption story. So a few years ago, I was um, speaking um, at the um, Sports Lawyers Association, their convention, and the keynote speaker was Justice Stevens. And apparently um, he is a very big Cubs fan. This was before they won the World Series. And they, um, the sports lawyers asked Major League Baseball to get him some gifts. So being that it's Justice Stevens, I went to the Cubs and um, – I got him all sorts of stuff. I mean, a, kind of a whole box. And the idea was he was going to give his speech, and then I was going to go present him with all this Cubs gear um, after the speech um, and congratulate him. So he walks to the podium, and um, the title of his speech was Why the Baseball Exemption Was the Worst Thing the Supreme Court Has Ever Done. Uh, I mean, I kid you not. And, 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 and for half an hour, I mean, he had notes and, and, uh, there, and, uh, um, and he just kind of just went off. Um, and, then, um, and people in the room were just kind of uncomfortable, right? So, um, you know, so, and, then, and then at the end, he just kind of implored the Supreme Court, you know, to reverse the great injustice um, <laughs> by conferring this benefit on baseball. So I got up there, and it was kind of an awkward moment. I asked him if he still wanted the Cubs stuff, and he, and he said yes. Um, and, and, um, and, and, and that was it. So, um, yeah, I mean, there, there was kind of a time when, um, um, you know, a lot of at least the commentators and I guess probably professors who – work um, at this law school, we're kind of opining um, 
you know, about the fate of the exemption. And, um, you know, recently um, we've had a lot of litigation. I mean, one of the, it's, I think all leagues have had a lot of litigation. We're just um, in a litigious society and um, we've been sued a lot by a lot of different people, a lot of different class action um, plaintiff's attorneys in the last five years. And we actually had to use the exemption, you know, quite more than we have had to rely on it in the past. Um, and as a result of that, um, we have a lot of circuit courts that have um, kind of reaffirmed and upheld the exemption, um, including the Ninth Circuit um, in a case um, involving San Jose. Um, they felt um, they were blocked from by MLB from um, having a chance to um, you know, get the Oakland A's by way of um, relocation, um, a case involving um, um, Major League Baseball scouts and the fact that we um, actually use a uniform um, employee contract for them that was challenged on antitrust grounds um, and the Second Circuit um, um, upheld the exemption and said that um, that practice, that employment practice is immune from antitrust scrutiny. Um, just I think two weeks ago or um, 10 days ago, the Seventh Circuit in a case that MLB was not involved in um, but involved the Cubs, some litigation um, with some rooftop owners. Those are the people that kind of own those bars um, that you can watch the games from. Um, that was another antitrust suit against the Cubs and um, court dismissed it on, uh, on baseball exemption ground. So, so one of the byproducts of just being sued a lot is, is we have a m much stronger, you know, kind of case law on the baseball um, exemption. And, you know, I, I think one of the, you know, primary, you know, reasons, um, you know, the circuits um, reaffirmed it is, you know, Congress had an opportunity when, you know, a statute was passed um, after the 95 strike that actually um, made subject to antitrust um, scrutiny um, baseball decisions involving its major league players, but um, left the rest untouched. So the um, courts are, if Congress wanted to change it, they could have changed it and they didn't. They kind of narrowed it in one respect, but not in um, any other respect. Um, so that was additional congressional intent that um, the baseball exemption um, you know, should be recognized. And even Miranda. Uh, with minor leaguers, yep. also. Yes, yes, uh, yes, Miranda. Under, under San Jose, which was a territorial. Regional. Right, yeah, it was how, you know, minor, they, there was a suit involving minor league um, baseball players. I mean, we actually have a <clears throat> current suit that's, um, you know, actually a um, very significant piece of litigation we're involved in that um, involves a class of minor league players claiming that they're subject to um, federal wage and hour laws. In other words, they should be treated... Um, like hourly workers and be paid an hour and if they work more than 40 hours a week or in some states more than eight hours a day, <clears throat> they get time and a half or double time. So that litigation's going on. There was a companion suit um, alleging antitrust violations um, based on the way um, we treat our minor league players. That was dismissed based on um, the baseball exemption. Thank you. Uh, uh, <laughs> Those of you in the intro class, take notes. It's on the exam. Mm -hmm. okay. <laughs> <laughs> we talked yesterday. Let's take a deeper dive into the CBA a little bit. Yesterday, you were kind enough to come. Could age eligibility in the NBA change uh, between CBAs? Um, it could change. The, the CBA that's just gone into effect this summer, um, and actually the previous CBA also set up a committee that was going to examine this rule, and I think our commissioner recently has made some public comments that he's open to examining it. There are some hmm. antitrust concerns there because, of course, we don't, you know, some of this is NCAA rules, not our rule. We have one rule that says you've got to be uh, 19 and a year out of high school before you can enter the NBA. And so, um, you know, we don't say what people have to do during that year. They could play in our minor league or go overseas, as some have, um, in addition to going to college. But I think everybody agrees that the current sort of setup is not ideal for the the athletes, um, especially with regard to the NCA rules about which classes you have to attend and what benefits you can receive while you're in school. So there's sort of an interesting interplay there between how much do we want to involve ourselves in what goes on in the NCAA uh, and how do we do what's best for these kids wanting to end our league while still being worried about the related business concerns, it's just way easier for me to do my job scouting guys. We don't have to go to every high school all over the country and see them play against 
you know, inferior talent most of the games. It's just easier when they're in college to identify the good players. Um, and they're also a year older um, and more mature, and you end up with, you know, fewer guys like, um, like Gerald Green, who we drafted. He's a good NBA player, but um, <coughs> we just had to draft him very young. Um, so there's, you know, I'm also supposed to be a Chicago economist, so there's this free market <coughs> part of me that says people should uh, be able to earn money whenever they can. But um, there are good business concerns for us to um, have argued in collective bargaining for what we got. Um, actually, the league was arguing for two or three years out of, out of high school, and the union wanted none. Um, there exists uh, of a, a decent set of cases, including a particular one in the NFL, that says you know, people in the league can represent people not yet in the league and collectively bargain these things. And so um, it's been collectively, you know, th the results of collective bargaining are often messy in what neither side wants. And I think that's where we've sort of ended up with this one year rule. But uh, everyone in the ecosystem kind of understands that there are some tensions here that maybe aren't ideal. And so the commissioner um, and the union uh, have got a group of people who are gonna be examining this question and um, it's kind of, you know, you always finish collective bargaining and there are always a set of still open issues that we just want to get on with the games and we'll sort of put these issues off to the side. Wearables is another one in the NBA right now. Um, and so it's going to get looked at. I don't, you know, you talk to a lot of fans and, and, and there's nobody who's very excited about the one year of, of college or whatever <laughs> it is else rule. Um, but there also aren't a lot of people who say we want to see a lot of 16-year-olds get drafted and sit on NBA benches, right? So, I mean, there's some interplay there. Well, and, and speak, speak to the recent change in the lottery system, too, to avoid the so-called tanking of teams. Sure, so this is not a collectively bargained right. issue at all. Um, people think it is. There's a clause in our CBA, and I don't know how it works in the other leagues. I'd actually be interested to hear that. The CBA requires there to be a draft, but it doesn't say how the draft is going to get conducted. Um, and, you know, it requires a rookie scale for guys drafted in the first round and so on and so forth. But um, this is sort of a pet issue of mine. Um, and so I could talk about it for much longer than we have today, and I'll, I'll try not to. <laughs> but basically, an issue we faced, and I think other leagues face, but maybe not as much because a single player doesn't make as much difference in a football game where they only play half the game or a baseball game where they're, you know, not involved in every play as much. Um, is that getting a high pick is just crucially important to getting a top player in the NBA. Most of the champions have those guys, you know, one of those guys on their team. So there's this perceived incentive, even if teams aren't all reacting to it, that your team should get really bad if you're not really good. Um, and that's just bad for business. It's not good for, fa you know, you might think it's morally bad to be teaching your kids that that's something that they should want their team to lose. Um, but even if you don't think that, people aren't paying to go watch your team play against a team that's only going to win 12 out of 82 games. Um, they might pay to go see a team that's going to win 25 out of 82 games because they've got some young guys and they're decent and they're winning some games. Um, but, you know, recently we've seen a couple teams, I mean, people bring up the, the Sixers a lot, but I actually think uh, Seattle and then Oklahoma City actually sort of embarked on a similar path where they got very bad playing young guys, <coughs> getting very high draft picks, and turning, you know, hopefully, according to them, into a good team. And so, um, you know, I had one idea, which was we're just going to get rid of the record-related incentives in the, in the draft altogether. <laughs> I still think it's a good idea. I got some press, but, um, you know, the goose is kind of golden right now for, for pro sports, and so <laughs> that would be a very drastic change, and people don't want to do it, and it makes sense. So the change that was just uh, approved by the Board of Governors and the NBA effectively says... Um, we're going to make it so that the bottom three teams in the NBA have equal odds at the top pick. And we'll reallocate some of those odds a little bit higher. So there's more of a chance that a slightly better team gets a, gets a, a, a top pick. But, but really, once you're at about 20 to 25 wins, you're not going to have incentive to make your team so much worse. Um, in all of these decisions, the leagues are balancing a number of concerns, right? You want to help bad teams. You don't necessarily want to help good teams. You don't like random effects where the same team could win three or four times. Um, you, you also don't necessarily want to have um, teams have incentives to be awful. And so you're sort of, or, or to lose games at the end of the season when they've locked in their playoff spot. That's another concern. So in any lottery system, you're sort of allocating between these different risks that you're choosing to take on more or less of. And so we've shifted to a little bit more random 
and a little bit more help better teams and really lower the risk that you're going to want to have uh, management of a team and even more so the fans of a team believe that the management of the team ought to um, try and create a historically awful team. And so that's, that's the point of that change. Come back to Dan. Well, the international draft was changed quite a bit in the last CBA negotiation. If you could speak to that. Yeah, um, yeah well, I'll talk just about amateur talent generally. I mean, the way our system works is um, players enter MLB um, one of two ways. That they're either drafted if they reside in the United States, um, Canada, or Puerto Rico, or they come in as international um, amateur players if um, they reside elsewhere. So we have two distinct systems. Um, once you come into MLB, um, you're um, almost always um, you know, assigned to the minor leagues, playing on a minor league contract, um, not represented by our Players Association. Um, and then at some point, you're promoted to what's called the 40-man roster, um, at which time you are represented by the union. Um, but you know, of those 40, only 25 are in the big leagues um, at any one time. So uh, our union represents 1,200 players. 25 of which, you know, April through August are playing in the major leagues. 15 are in the monitors on option. And then in September, um, another issue which we didn't resolve um, in, in bargaining, um, um, you know, clubs can play um, up to 40 players um, if they want. Uh, you know, in terms of the way the economics work, um, once you um, are on a 25-man roster, the for your first three years, you're paid the major league minimum, which now is you know five hundred thousand plus change. Um, you know after three years of service, I mean, some small group of players with two years of service also attain it. You um, have the right to have your salary determined by um, arbitration, it's baseball arbitration, um, and then um, after six years of service, you become uh, a free agent. So. Um, what we changed in two, the 2011 bargaining on the draft side, um, we actually put in um, bonus restrictions. Um, it's essentially has worked as a cap in terms of what um, players um, who are drafted can receive. Um, before that time, clubs can pay them whatever they wanted to pay them. Um, now, um, you know, every player one through 300 um, is given a slot, a dollar amount, the first pick. Um, seven million, and it just goes on right down until you kind of hit a hundred thousand. Um, if you add up um, kind of all the club slots from all the selections it ha um, it receives, you know, that's a dollar amount: five million, seven million, nine million. That's how much they have to spend in the draft. Um, on the domestic side, if they go over their their cap, if you will, by more than five percent, um, they lose a first round pick. Um, the next year, and that has never happened since 2011. A club has never sort of exceeded its pool, so it's kind of served as a cap. On the international side, we really kind of didn't um, get a system that worked in 2011. Um, we bargained hard for an international draft, um, kind of separate international draft, so all those players that are not subject to our domestic draft would be put in their own um, draft. The union... Um, vigorously opposed an international draft, um, um, large, not for economic reasons, I'll tell you, largely because um, its membership, which um, you know, is 30% foreign-born, um, and the majority of those foreign-born players are from the Dominican Republic, just felt it would stifle baseball um, in the DR. Um, so we ended up um, agreeing to actually a hard cap um, on the international side. Um, you know, slanted towards um, our lower um, revenue and smaller market clubs. So each club gets a, a pot of money to spend, um, but the smaller market, lower revenue clubs get a bigger pot to spend, giving them an advantage in that market because it's a hard cap. So um, the Marlins, uh, for example, may get, um, you know, f I think it's $5.75 million um, this year, where the Yankees will get um, $4.7 million. And, and they can't exceed that amount um, in terms of international players they sign. One exception, if you're 25 years old and played in a foreign league for six years, you get to come over as a free agent. Um, that really affects um, Japanese players who play in the MPB. Um, and Cuban players, 
really and some some Korean players. Thanks, Dan. And one last. You have, you have a question. We're, we're, we're going to just save questions for, for a little bit. Okay. Uh, just one other ch big change, a couple big changes in the NBA CBA, uh, the patches, the ads, and sure. then, and then the, and the players' association <laughs> taking over the licensing rights with the players. Well, this um, on the jersey patches. I don't know how many people are watching the NBA this year in the room, but uh, you know we've more than half of the teams now have a, an advertising patch on their jersey, and actually. This goes back to something Dan was talking about earlier where, I mean, the players and the owners have been very excited to do this for, I think, six or seven years. There's been pretty uniform agreement on both sides of that. You know, people think, well, this isn't happening because the players don't want to wear some sponsor. They don't want to wear it. It's <coughs> not true at all. Um, the big debate in the NBA was how to share the revenue from these patches among the teams. Um, because, you know, the, the Knicks and the Lakers, for example, get the most for their patches, um, you know, just assuming equal team quality. I think the, the Warriors deal is probably the most right now. Um, but, you know, you need another team to play the game, and that team is going to go travel to other cities, and those cities want their share of that advertising that's going to be shown on their court. So that dispute actually took many years to resolve among the owners, and it's exactly the kind of thing uh, Dan was talking about earlier, where these are the most difficult issues that the league office deals with. If you talk to people in the NBA league office, they'll tell you that issue vexed them for, for quite a number of years, even after pretty much everyone on both sides of players and owners, you know, other than people like my dad who think there should still only be organ music in the games. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, I'm not so different from him, actually. Um, um, you know, had sort of gotten past it and was ready to have a, a patch on the jersey like most of the international teams' uh, sports do. Um, it's just another source of revenue to grow the pie for all of us. Um, but they finally made a deal uh, a couple of years ago, and this is the first year of having jersey patches in the NBA, and so far it's gone great. You know, we did a deal with GE where there are some other things included in the deal. In addition to just uh, having a patch on the jersey, they're actually helping us with some data science things and some medical equipment and scans that we're doing with our players. So it's turned, that's been a driver for sort of more stuff for us than just can we put a logo on our jersey. Um, not all of the deals have worked that way. Utah's got an interesting deal where they, they have a deal with a, a company, Qualtrics, but, but Qualtrics' logo isn't on the jersey. It's a, a fighting cancer charity that they've agreed to put uh, on the jersey. So there's lots of you know, inventive things to do there, and teams overseas are very comfortable with this. If you buy my favorite soccer team's Arsenal, if you buy an Arsenal jersey any time in the last 30 years, it's going to have some big uh, corporate sponsor on it, and a little Arsenal patch that's the size of our sponsor patches. I don't know if we're ready to go quite that far, but um, i got to imagine... Teams don't want to ignore this revenue source in, in other leagues for too long, even though there's this purity of the game uh, argument. At a certain point, the, the dollars tend to win on these things. Mm -hmm. um, you, asked also, <laughs> you asked also about Spoken licensing like change. There actually hasn't been a huge licensing change in the NBA. The, the players took over the ability to license the images of groups of players. It, it was already the case that the teams didn't have the ability to license individual players' image except for ticket and broadcasting sales. Um, otherwise, an individual team would have a huge advantage in a big market of getting free agents because you could just say, well, I can only pay you, you know, the NBA max salary for your years of service, which, you know, for a guy might be 20 or 30 million, <laughs> but I've got these 20 sponsors here who will license your image for another 100 million. Um, you can't do that. The league polices it pretty closely, um, you know, and that we could have a discussion about ways to do that <coughs> if you guys want. But, um, you know, there was a league group license um, that some media points were made out of that the union insisted on taking back. The problem is that when you're licensing groups of players, you usually want them in game or all wearing their uniforms. And so you still need an NBA license anyway. And so the union and the league have been working closely together on that. Um, you know, the, 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 union, the league used to have to pay the union that, that was part of the group licensing agreement. Now we don't have to make that payment to the union, but they control those images and they have to come to us to get the league licenses. So the arrangement's about the same as just the logistics of getting that license have changed. Thanks. Jeff, I want to come back to you. Again, when you came to the class, you're kind enough to talk about new stadia being constructed and, and uh, the, the franchise relocations that have been happening recently. And you did the Raiders litigation, so you know how to reload a team with I get sued. <laughs> right. Or not. Right. <laughs> but uh, maybe you want to speak to, to the growth of the game. Then I want to go to internationalization of, of the game as well. Uh, sure. Um, 
when I when I started working uh, for the NFL, uh, there were no teams in uh, you know Charlotte or uh, Jacksonville. Uh, we had uh, we had a period of real instability in the mid 1990s, where you had teams moving around. Two teams left Los Angeles. Uh, Baltimore was vacated. So, in an effort to deal with that there were a number of things that were done, the most significant of which involved, as you say, stadium financing, where we put in place what uh, came to be known as the G3 and now in its successor, the G4 program, where the other 31 clubs in the league will make direct financial investments to support stadium construction for the 32nd team. So when the... Uh, uh, Rams and the Chargers are now building the stadium at Hollywood Park in California, in Los Angeles to bring the NFL back to a new stadium in Los Angeles. That is being supported in part by investments of $400 million, which are being made by the other 30 clubs in the league to help support that stadium construction. In addition, as part of our collective bargaining agreements over the past 15 years or so, the union has recognized the benefits. This goes to my broader point about the unity of economic <laughs> interest here. The union has recognized the benefits of new stadium construction and what that means for player salaries and player working environment. If you look at the you know, old stadiums where players worked and compare them to new stadiums, just those of you who remember you know, Sullivan Stadium, Foxborough Stadium, Schaefer Stadium, whatever, you know, there were there it's are high the schools. Stadium. There are high schools. There are high schools who play in better facilities, and you compare it to Gillette Stadium. Well, it was well worth the investment that the NFL players made in terms of credits against the salary cap to support the building of stadiums there: Philadelphia, Pittsburgh, Cleveland, many other cities. So that's been a very positive, uh, a positive aspect of it too. And so, we have in this new collective bargaining agreement that we have. Uh, over the past five or six years, something like $5 billion of new stadium investment has been committed, whether it's new stadiums in places like Atlanta or Minnesota or very substantial renovations and improvements in stadiums uh, all across the league. And obviously that's going to grow with Los Angeles, Las Vegas, and, uh, and other communities. And the point you make, make so well, too, is the whole pie keeps growing. The defined gross revenue, however you want to define it, keeps growing. And, eat, and whatever the percentage is for the Player Association, the pie is bigger and bigger. Exactly. And, and, and it's, uh, it's just, it supports the, 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 the mutuality of investment and the commitment to growing the game is something that I think people recognize benefits players and owners alike. And we, we, we also like to think it benefits fans as well because they're seeing games in facilities that are really so much nicer, so much more commodious, so much better uh, than uh, where they used to go. Could, could we stay with you and talk about internationalization? London, could we have a team in London? Uh, we could have a team in London. Um, I, think the, uh, I think the primary issue in London is no longer a, a serious question of fan support because each year we're playing more games in London. This weekend we'll play our fourth game. And uh, the games are selling out uh, very rapidly and, uh, and really not in a way that, in, in, in fairness, is all that fan-friendly because we are playing some games at Wembley. We play some games at a stadium called Twickenham. The two stadiums are quite different in terms of location, amenities, uh, quality. Um, but, and, and when the schedule comes out, fans in London don't know which game will be played in which stadium or necessarily what time it will be. Some games are earlier in the day. Some games are later in the day. So it's not the most fan-friendly arrangement that could ever be imagined. But the games sell out very quickly, and our marketing people in London would be very proud to tell you that it's not American expats necessarily buying these tickets, that tickets are bought from every location in the United Kingdom including Northern Ireland, including Scotland, uh, Wales. So all over the country, people are buying and coming to London to watch the games. So I don't think it's a fan support issue. We get very, very good numbers on BBC and Sky. 
I think it really is going to come down to a competitive issue. And you can imagine a, a circumstance, if you're, if you're an owner and you're trying to decide whether to put a team in London or not, do you want to be the owner whose team has to fly from Phoenix, Arizona, or Denver, Colorado, to London in week 16 to win a game to get into the playoffs or not? Do you want to do that? Do you want to be the owner who's got to go there and have your team play in a wild card game in the first week in the playoffs and then maybe have to fly all the way back across eight or nine time zones? So I think there's a serious competitive issue. And there's also an issue which I was, I must say I was surprised uh, at this, and I don't, know, I don't know if it was just this one conversation, but in 2011 when we were talking with, uh, with the union about some of these issues, a couple of the executives, player executives, not corporate-type executives, but players who were executives, expressed great uh, reluctance at the notion that players would want to go play for a team in London or play for a team in Mexico City. And that, that kind of surprised me because I've always thought that as a young person, to get to go live in, a, in, a, in another city, in another country, whether it's London, Hong Kong, Mexico City, Paris, where it would be a great experience. And uh, they didn't show much interest in that at all. So would a team in London be able to attract free agents? Would a team in London be able to maintain players it drafted? Or would it be they'd come in, play their rookie contract, and get back to the United States as soon as possible? I think that's a real issue, too. How about on baseball, Dan? Do you, do you see it? Uh, international competition, more and more games that we play. Yeah, well, when... Commissioner Manford became commissioner in 2015. Um, you know, international expansion of baseball was kind of one of his um, priorities. Um, we, under Commissioner Seelig, um, we implemented something called the World Baseball Classic, um, which has been around since 2006. Um, and Commissioner Manford wanted to build on that. Um, we bargained heavily over international play um, during the last round. The priority um, is Mexico. I mean, we would like to actually play games, multiple games in Mexico um, every year. Um, we will play in the next couple of years um, in the UK, in London. Um, we'll bring two teams there. Um, and, you know, historically we have played um, in the Far East, in, in Japan um, and Korea, which are more uh, mature um, baseball markets. Um, j just like Jeff said, I mean, even bargaining over, you know, scheduling, you know, one game um, internationally can be difficult. We, we play, um, you know, 162 games in um, um, 183 days. Um, and, you know, the things you hear about for players, it's, you know, great playing um, in London, but, you know, they have to come back um, and play, um, you know, right away. And, you know, it's hard even to, to just give them an off day um, Sam, you know, sandwiched around the game. So, you know, it's challenging because we have a lot of games, um, but it's important. Um, there's not because there's not that many places in the world, relatively speaking, that play baseball. You know, just like football, um, and you know, you need to expand your fan base. So, we're putting a lot of money on it. Um, you know, when you play games internationally, as Jeff will tell you, um, um, you know, they're not. Always profitable. I mean, it's kind of like a loss oh, lead. Oh, always, <laughs> they're not. No. Yeah, they're, they're not. Maybe I mean, ever? It, ever. I mean, they're well. It depends. I mean, so you know, most most international games um, are not profitable. I mean, you're investing in your business. They're kind of like loss leaders, where you're trying to develop a fan base. Um, um, and it helps, you know, if, you, if you're able to do it, obviously it helps in negotiating international broadcast agreements and selling merchandise and whatnot. But, um, you know, the NBA actually has been, um, under David and Adam, have been very successful um, with an international strategy that probably goes back 20, 25 years. And, um, you know, basketball, professional basketball is probably watched, you know, in more, more countries than um, maybe baseball and the NFL combined right now, which is a credit to them. Um, but we're all focused on it. Mm -hmm. yeah, Mike, do you want to speak to that? We'll play a regular season game in London this January, and we played one in Mexico City uh, last year. Um, but the commissioner's been pretty clear that playing games uh, outside of North America is just not going to happen logistically anytime soon. Um, we're having a team uh, outside of North America. We'll play individual games there, but it's just... <coughs> 
you know, it's the same thing. We play 82 games um, in, in, you know, six months, and you could imagine a playoff series between Phoenix and London, for example, <laughs> um, where you've got, you know, eight hours of time zone difference and having to go back and forth between games five, six, and seven uh, just it isn't going to happen. Um, you know, not, not unless Elon Musk comes up with some crazy <laughs> uh, transit scheme. Yeah. Um, so a- absent that, you know, I, I think our focus has been very much, um, you know, I do think the NBA is very interested in Mexico City. There will be two or three games played there this year. Um, like I said, we played there last year, and there have been some games there before. Um, getting NBA arenas different places is also an interesting question. There's only four or five in all of Europe right now that would, would support an NBA game, although those ones are really nice. Um, but so the focus for the NBA has been very much on uh, media rights and promotion overseas. Um, we are also trying to grow the game in other countries. Um, you know, every summer there's four or five Basketball Without Borders events where they bring camps of people. Um, there's been one in Johannesburg every year uh, from different places um, to learn from some of the game's best coaches and players. <laughs> Um, the league has just opened a, a series of, I think, eight academies around the world. Um, most interestingly, I think, in India, where uh, league programs will build 12,000 basketball courts in the next 10 years. Um, there's a billion people in India, and mostly they watch cricket and soccer. Mm-hmm. So um, we're trying to change that. It's been very successful in China. We're sort of neck and neck with um, soccer or football, as you might call it, and some people might call it, not Jeff, obviously, um, in China. <laughs> But, uh, um, you know, there was a game a few years ago in China that was watched by more Chinese people than the entire U.S. adult population. Um, And so (laughs) there's a market there. (laughs) Um, So uh, the league has been very focused on that. They created, I think, 10, 15 years ago an entity called NBA China in conjunction with a bunch of other um, corporate partners over there, and that's been very successful in growing the game there. So rather than focusing on moving teams overseas, which you know all of us have these logistical problems, maybe maybe some leagues less than others just because of you know one game a week or something like that. But even then, it's no good for you. So you can imagine when you're playing four or five games a week, it's just not gonna not gonna work. Um, and instead, you just want to generate fan interest there, and um, you know maybe someday there'll be minor leagues in those places that that feed our league. Let's finish up, and then we will allow the last 15 minutes or so for questions. Uh, Dan, you want to talk about sports betting generally and thinking of the Las sure. Vegas Raiders? Sure. Excited to talk about yeah, sports Yeah, I'm betting. excited to talk about it. I'll do it from the, <laughs> since we're in a law school, I'll do it from the legal perspective. Of, unless Professor Tribe here has helped me out. Um, actually, I had Professor Tribe, and Barack Obama was in my class. I was, af- I was always afraid to raise my hand. Um, and um, so he actually he talked a lot in that class. So... Um, there's something called the Professional and Amateur Sports Protection Act, PASPA is the acronym. It was passed in 1992 and um, prohibits, um, with the exception of Nevada, really just Nevada now, um, um, Delaware, I guess, could do lotteries, um, states from authorizing, promoting, there's some more verbiage in there, sports betting. Um, it also um, prohibits... Um, individuals from participating in state-sponsored um, sports betting. So New Jersey um, I think amended um, their constitution to um, allow sports betting um, in casinos. A um, bunch of the leagues, including MLB and the NBA and the NCAA, um, sued. Um, and the district court enjoined New Jersey from proceeding. The Third Circuit um, upheld it. Um, under the theory it, it violated PASPA. So then um, New Jersey hired some creative lawyers and they gave it another try. This time um, they um, didn't um, quote unquote authorize sports betting in the casinos. They, they basically just said sports betting is illegal everywhere in New Jersey except for you know if you're gamble in a casino located in um, Atlantic City um, or at a horse track. So their claim, we're not authorizing anything. We're just not making it illegal. Um, the district court enjoined them again. The Third Circuit um, um, upheld that it violates PASPA. I, I, um, New Jersey asked for a rehearing. Um, Third Circuit, full Third Circuit, I think it was like nine to three, um, upheld the injunction again. Um, 
but the Supreme Court um, recently granted cert. Um, I was just telling these guys on the flight down, I actually finally read the Solicitor General's brief um, um, in the case, and the Solicitor General is actually kind of on the side of the sports leagues that New Jersey um, is violating um, PASPA, but it, it's really a big constitutional issue, and um, but that has very little to do with sports betting. Um, you know, the issue um, it involves the Tenth Amendment, which um, is the commandeering clause, and says the federal government can't commandeer a state to enforce um, a federal law. Um, and New Jersey's arguing that um, the federal government in PASPA, you know, didn't, um, you know, make a illegal um, sports betting. It's basically telling a state, you know, you make sports betting illegal by, by not authorizing it. So they're claiming um, um, PASPA commandeers um, the state by basically forcing it to enact laws that make illegal sports betting. I mean, that that's, you know, you know, Professor Tribe would probably do a better job, but that's essentially the gist of um, of what New Jersey's um, arguing. Um, as an aside, you should probably read the Solicitor General's brief. I mean, um, it's as Jeff was saying too. It's a very impressive office. I mean, you read. You know, I don't read briefs uh, uh, as frequently as I used to, but you read the brief, and you know they know how to write a brief. I mean, they're very good lawyers. So if you're a law student here thinking of something to do when you get out. Um, um, I will hire you if you go work there um, when you're <laughs> when you're when you're ready to come out. So it's it's an interesting legal issue, and in terms of the policy issue, um, Mike can talk more about that because his commissioner, Commissioner Silver, kind of has been very public that um, he believes that um, you know sports betting um, you know should be uh, permitted, um, although. Um, if it is, it should be done pursuant to a federal statute. Um, my commissioner and Jeff's commissioner have not publicly taken a position, so um, you know we will not publicly take a position on it sitting here. But it is an interesting, you know, legal issue, and it's going to get argued um, in the beginning of December. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think that's a slightly different thing than than Commissioner Silver has said. So what he said is. He doesn't really want to take a position on whether sports betting should be permitted or not. Um, it, it's not, you know, this, this isn't a moral thing, but, but guess what? It's happening. Like, any of you in five minutes could figure out how to go place a bet on a game tonight if you left this room and wanted to do that, or probably maybe some of you in the back are actually betting on games right now. Yeah. Um, yeah. So uh, <laughs> it wouldn't surprise me. And if you're not betting on games, you're doing some sort of daily fantasy thing if you're of a certain age uh, or, or, or maybe of any age. And, and, you know, there's some questions as to the legality of that in all sorts of different jurisdictions. But the fact remains that it's become exceedingly easy to place wagers of some sort or another on sporting events, regardless of what you call a wager. And so um, Adam's point is just, well, look, if this is going on, I mean, it clearly relates to all of our games. Right. Um, why aren't we sharing in that? And why aren't we protecting our fans from um, some of the unsavory characters who might be profiting from this because it's illegal? Uh, and and. Really, I haven't sort of heard a good argument against that other than the general sort of gambling is bad and, and should be prohibited arguments, um, which are fine, except we have decided to allow all sorts of other gambling in casinos and lotteries and all sorts of other things. So, um, you know, there is this for the good of the game thing, we shouldn't have betting on games because players will be influenced to change what they do in games. Um, but in many, many other jurisdictions in the world, um, there is betting on games. There obviously have been some scandals, even here with things illegal, uh, involving players manipulating games. And so the thought is the more regulation you have in this field, uh, the easier it is to get data that will enable you to sniff out uh, cheating in these things. Um, actually, you know, way before law school, spent some time working for Steve Levitt, who wrote the book Freakonomics. And one of the things I did one summer was use Greyhound betting data, which is all very public, uh, to try and find cheating in greyhound racing, right? And that was kind of a fun project that that an economy, you know, econ student can do. Um, these things are much much easier if it's legal and regulated. And also, you can start licensing these things and putting your logos on them, and that makes the pie bigger for everyone, which is all mm -hmm. of what we've been talking about here. So I, I think that's the 
Commissioner, and our league's view uh, in general is that it's kind of inevitable that sports wagering is going to become easier and easier through technological means, and absent some drastic change in liberties online, um, we might as well be participating in that market rather than watching it happen illicitly. Okay. Jack, please, comment. Well, the, the thing I, I would say on that is that I think the legal issue and the economic issue are going to run into one another. Because if New Jersey's argument is correct, and the current done. federal statute involves improper commandeering under the Tenth Amendment, which, uh, as 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 Dan said, the Solicitor General's office did a very very good job, and I thought actually the brief that Paul Clement, a former Solicitor General, filed on on behalf of all of us in the NCA, also did a very good job on it. But if that argument is accepted. I think it will be very difficult, very difficult, take a lawyer, a hell of a lot better lawyer than me, to come up with a federal statute that will regulate sports betting in all 50 states in a uniform way that will not similarly run afoul of commandeering issues. Either the supremacy clause of the Constitution applies, in which case there should be no issue as to the legality of PASPA, or if it does not apply because it is a form of commandeering for the Congress of the United States to command states to regulate sports betting in one way and one way only when gambling has traditionally been regulated by states either to permit it as in Nevada or New Jersey or to outlaw it as it's outlawed in many other places. I think, as, I think there's a tremendous tension there and I think I also uh, think, as a practical matter, if New Jersey prevails in the Supreme Court, I think by the time the Congress gets around to doing something about sports betting, you will have so many different types of laws and regulatory schemes passed in the 50 states that you will be I don't know what happens after the horse is out of the barn, but that's where you'll be. You'll be chasing, the horse will be so far away, you won't be able to see it. Uh, it would be like me running against Secretariat. You know, that's, that's, <laughs> it, it, there's no chance, I think, that the Congress can put that genie back in the bottle.